The newly signed Kama faces criticism from the church and growing concerns over security at the upcoming Edo elections. This is Plus Politics, and I am Osaogi Ogbawam. The newly signed Companies and Allied Matters Act 2020 comes under fire from several stakeholders, including pastors and the Christian Association of Nigeria Can. The Christian body has rejected the act, describing the section 839 of the law, which empowers the supervising minister to suspend trustees of an association, in this case the church, and appoint the interim managers to manage the affairs of the association as satanic. The presiding bishop of the Living Faith Church Worldwide, David Oedipo, also advised the federal government to remove the same part from the act. Joining us to discuss this is Yomi Kasali, senior pastor of Foundation of Truth Good Assembly via yeah. Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Good. Thank you, Osagi. I appreciate it. Nice to be here today. It's a pleasure. Let, let's start with asking, what, what would you say are the biggest issues the church has with the Kama Act? And do you feel that this act was brought up specifically uh, to target churches? Well, I would, um, I would decline with respect to targeting the church. I do not think the church is uh, the primary target with uh, this Kama uh, law. Uh, I, I would grant, honestly believe that it's the, our brothers on the other side of the faith that have, uh, that have been funded, they have been funded by some of the, um, uh, in Iran, you know, and um, I don't think it's a threat as a primary target. However, uh, the clause that uh, in contention today has to do with the powers of the, to remove trustees and replace them with internal managers should the trustees be found comfortable uh, with respect to fraudulent activities and mismanagement and misconduct. But you need to understand that particular clause, um, that satanic clause, 839, subsection 1, 2, and 3. I've read it through and through all through today, and I'm not too sure that's what that clause uh, clearly says. I've read it, and the commission I found out does not have the powers to remove trustees arbitrarily, but they have to go order court. So people do not in subsection two, we seem to have magnified subsection one and ignored subsection two of that uh, clause in 839. They have to go to court. They can't arbitrarily just come up and wake up one day from whether the weak side of the bed, good or the bad side of the bed, and just remove the trustees. And another thing that we also have to note is the fact that um, the trustees of uh, churches are not usually more than three, four, five, maybe ten. And then some of the key church leaders are not trustees, and some are trustees. And uh, they, they can't stop us from preaching, teaching, leading, or coordinating or running our churches. Um, trustees are probably those that the government, in the eye of the law, they see and they recognize as um, the faces behind the organization. And if we are charity and charitable companies, we should be able to understand the power that the trustees have and should not have. So I, 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 I would like to refrain from making some of that comments today because the parent body that we all belong to, CAN, Christian Association of Nigeria, has issued a statement rejecting KAMA uh, in its own entirety, uh, even though it's a 600-page law, uh, and uh, most of it actually has to be companies and... Um, maybe allied matters where we come up to, where we, where we come into. So I, I would want to refrain myself from speaking totally on my views, but I would also say a few of my own thoughts with respect to uh, the laws as you asked me the further question. So that's what I think uh, for the moment. Okay, and, and you know, now that you've brought in Khan, you know, there's a couple of things that I would like to speak with regards to the Christian Association of Nigeria, and I hope that you'll be at liberty to share with us. Um, uh, first of all, you know, you said uh, the Section 839 and, of course, other subsections 
um, may have been misinterpreted. Um, do you think that the Christian Association of Nigeria hasn't also thoroughly looked through, you know, that section 839? Well, I, I would say yes, in my opinion. You know, um, I found out that in the past, we look, we react emotionally and not, unfortunately, logically. We do not look at things uh, different. Even the Bible says so. Somewhere in Luke chapter 10, verse 26, Jesus said, what is written in the law? Then he says, how do you read it? You see, there are two different questions. What is written and how do you read it? The second question is the interpretation question. The first question is what is written? And so you need to understand that mo most people do not know how or how to interpret that law. I strongly believe that that law does not say that the commission, corporate affairs commission, have the right to remove trustees without going to court. It says clearly in uh, section two that they shall have to go to court uh, or a fifth of the membership of the church. It's either the commission or 20% of members, not worshippers. Most churches uh, have membership and they have worshippers. You can have a million worshippers, only 100,000 members. So it's a 20% of your members or the commission, should they find infraction or issues that you've done against the law, they will then go to court, the court of law, a competent court of law, and you can go to the same court to defend yourself, would say no. And should the court find out that if you've not done anything, uh, to violate the law with respect to management of that organization, be it NGO or church, and church now, because we're speaking about church. And should the church find that you've not had any fraudulent mis uh, or mismanagement, then the court will strike the, 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 the commission's plea or prayer out. But if the court of law finds out that the commission has a, has a case and um, that the, the trustees are violated, and if it violated the the part of their sub own their own constitution. In other words, we're laundering money, we're keeping some um, some drug money, we're doing things that shouldn't be done in the name of church, in the name of the charity. The commission has a right. You see, the problem is your okay, I was gonna ask you if I have the right to hire and I don't have the right to fire, there's a problem. No entity exists without going to CSC to register. And this time around, they are not deregistering the churches. They are not deregistering the charities. They are simply, like they do abroad, saying, we found some misconduct, we found some mismanagement, and probably fraud in this organization. And we found that the trustees are complicit, or if they are not, they are silent. They've not met for five years, six years, seven years. You don't even understand how the funds are coming in and going out. You know, in the UK, one of the finest and the biggest churches, the giant churches in the UK a few years ago, they found the same things on them. And, and they had to remove the trustees. And they appointed interim. The word is interim for the moment. It's not a permanent structure. It's interim while we put things in order and put governance uh, structures in the place. Thereafter, while that is going on, you can preach the gospel, you can do anything you want to do. After all, the Bible says, do I'm in prison, the word of God cannot be in prison. Nobody can silence the church. Nobody can silence us from preaching the gospel. We are a secular state. Nobody can stop any preacher from preaching. We have social media, we have churches. They're not taking the church from us. Nobody can take my church from me because I'm the senior pastor of our church. Should I, however, eh, mismanage the resources of the people and I'm a trustee, I'll be glad if you can come and help me to tell me how I should manage it better. You get the point now, if there are some funds there. So they do that and they get out after two years, three years. So I think we should be careful how we're making too much noise over absolutely nothing. I am all for transparency and accountability. And um, I've always said, uh, Osage, that if we, we don't regulate ourselves, that uh, the government will be forced to regulate us. And most of us making noise are the Pentecostal flock, not those that are a bit more organized than the Baptist, Methodist, Anglican, Catholic, they're very organized. They're structure there. And a few of us that are the loudest, the most vocal, are the least structured and were the most reckless, unfortunately. Uh, with all sense of honesty, humility, I say that. Okay, and, and now, because I mean, earlier in the, in the conversation, you already stated that there's some things that you wouldn't want to go into. But I, I, I'm tempted to always ask, 
um, when I hear some <laughs> points that you make. I, I want to now know if you feel that it's a, it's a long time coming, you know, and, you know, like you said, you know, if you don't um, caution yourselves, eventually the, the government will have to step in, you know, to caution. So do you think that this has is something that has been, you know, coming for the longest time and it is only just finally arriving um, with regards to Nigerian churches? Do you think that for the longest time there has been Absolutely. need to look deeper into the financial statements of some of these churches, mostly Pentecostal churches, and it's finally, finally only just happening now? I, I, I absolutely. During the former administration, not this APC government, the Jonathan government, there was a body called Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria, headed by one very sound guy, but very volatile. I think it was Jim Obaze. It was almost signed into law under Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria. And to regulate the finances, we fought against it, and we kicked against it. We didn't like the fact that they were going to start poking their noses into the church finances. However, they said, no, no, it's just to fight money laundering. You know, if you want to fight terrorism and money laundering, they call it follow the money. You know, people they felt were hiding funds in the churches. Look at what happened with Magu recently. Whether it's an allegation, we don't know how true it is, that a church was used to keep some money. I mean, it could be false accusation, but the very fact that the thing is a front burner is a thing of shame, and we should look at ourselves again. I am for transparency. This has a long, long comment because it's very clear that a few of us have acted recklessly with the wealth that we think the churches have. And, and uh, most, most churches, um, with, with due respect, we do well with apostolic mandate. We do greatly with our preaching and teaching. We've expanded our churches. But a few of us still have governance issues. We're not perfect. The government itself is not perfect. So everybody, we're all working towards perfection. We have governance issues. So if these issues are governance issues, corporate governance issues, uh, uh, and we have to ask ourselves, if the government sees what is wrong in our, in our, in our territory, should, do they have powers to regulate and to make laws? Yes. Are we happy with these laws? No. Uh, as can reject the laws? Yes. Um, should we go to court to fight and contest it? Yes. Then the court of law, which is the third branch of government, is the government we're going to anyway. I keep saying that. I cannot register foundation of the assembly on my own. I have to abide by the laws of the land. And this land, if I go to China to start a church, I will have to abide by the laws in China. If I go to Uganda, I will have to abide by the laws in Uganda. You know, so we need to be able to discern and decipher the scriptures rightly. You know, it is true that God gave us the vision to plant a church. That God told Moses, see that you build this according to pattern. That was the tabernacle. That was the tabernacle. Moses wore two caps. He was both the one that built the tabernacle, also the president of a nation. He gave civil laws, criminal laws for a nation. He had capital punishment for the citizens of Israel in the wilderness. However, that was a theocratic nation that had a religious responsibility. So that was the church in a theocratic government is different from the church in a democratic government. We're a secular state. We're democratic. We have Muslims and Christians. This is for Muslim churches, churches, mosques, NGOs. I think we should be we should we should talk less and, and think more and then go to court. I, I totally agree because I'm a member of Khan. I cannot I cannot be a rebel to fight my own body. I spoke to the president of Khan a few hours ago and he told me why they why Khan had to reject karma provisions. And I stand by Khan because I am a member of Khan through the PFN branch. However, as an individual, I've just shared with you my own thoughts, my opinion. One, I'm for transparency. Two, I'm for, uh, for, for fight against corruption and graft. Three, I'm against all saying we cannot be open and uh, be accountable. I've only said that in our own church here, I'm accountable, and uh, not to the government, but to my members and to our leaders and to our deacons. And so I tell them, this is how much money came in last year. This is how we spent it. I know a church where the pastor does sign checks. Do you know, Sagi, that the biggest church for many years in the world, single denomination, single church, single building, Paul Yonggi Cho in South Korea, a few years ago, the government found $12 million spent in, in his family. They jailed his son and they gave him three years suspended sentence. He's there on the internet. And that's a man that had strong influence on a country called South Korea. One out of every 10 
Koreans attend his church. Yet, there was so much transparency, too much openness. And they said, sir, we found that the church spent $12 million into your house wrong, wrongfully. And that's gross misconduct and financial misappropriation. You have to go to jail. But because of his elder statesman status, he said, spend a sentence. However, his son, I think, is serving jail term. We need to get to the place where we can be transparent. We, the Nigeria must move forward. Yeah. And we're saying it's time for us to do things right. Many of our pastors can't do what they do in Nigeria, in America, and England. But even, they can't do it. And they want to continue to live a banana republic. And I don't believe that government should make laws to protect the high and mighty. A good nation makes laws to protect the weak and feeble. We must protect the members of our churches. Because those that are protected here are probably the high and mighty in our circles. Um, and, and now, um, I would like to ask about the image of the church. Um, does, you know, the fact that, of course, can as a body, um, there's also, you know, one or two Pentecostal pastors, with all due respect, um, you know, I believe uh, you would say, um, that are also fighting, you know, this um, uh, act. Um, does this in any way affect the image of the church and make it look very much like the church has things to hide? Because I believe that you would, um, I don't know if you would agree that lately, lately there's also been issues of trust, you know, amongst Nigerians. People have painted the church as, you know, places where a lot of money just passes through without, you know, any auditing. And, you know, there, there's so much going on financially, you know, with the church. So does this affect the image of the church seeing Khan um, rejecting the Kama Act? Uh, it shouldn't, but it is. Uh, Khan is not rejecting the Kama Act because um, of the trust issues that the citizens have um, against the church. I think uh, Khan is rejecting it because I believe strongly, and I've spoken to the president, that we believe it's an invasion of our rights. Let me tell you what, what, what we have in Khan. Every church has our own constitution, internal democracy, a, a, a book that we use to govern ourselves. I belong to a church where every year we have an annual membership meeting. We used to have that meeting. Uh, we'll give an account of how much money came in and how we spent it. And members, we have opportunities that doing AGMM to ask questions and then to also challenge a few things that we do. Now, most churches and Pentecostals don't do that. That Pentecostal church I belong to was run, was run very well. Uh, and they did that well, you know. And, and I, I picked that up and I'm practicing it now in my own church. However... Ken believes that the government should not, should not be given powers to, number one, gag and stop us from preaching. And I agree with the president that if these laws get into the hand of a despot, uh, someone tyrannical, someone that is um, against opposition, the moment every preacher, like our revered man of God in altar, doing great work, by the way, the moment he speaks against something in the government, they might use the laws against them to remove them. I doubt if that's easy, as easy as that. I totally don't agree. Because even though they changed up. Paul, it did not change the word of God. Nobody can stop any preacher from preaching. As long as they wouldn't imprison me. Even if you remove me from being a board of trustee members, like a brother in Ukraine, a man of God, he can still preach through to social media. He can, his voice can still be heard. The gospel can still be spoken, it can be preached and taught. Nobody can stop you from preaching. We have not made a law to say, thou shalt not preach. You know, and so and it, the, the, the hurdles to cross. You have to go to the court of law to get an order. I keep saying it. Commission cannot do it without a court of law, subsection two. Now, trust issues. Do we see our social trust with our people? No. Do people think less of churches and pastors? Yes. Do people disrespect us more? Yes. They just need to go to social media and see how they abuse us, they slander us, they curse us. And the bulk of it is because they believe we're so extravagant in our lifestyle, we're flamboyant, we're not living for the people, we're fraternizing with politicians, we're taking government money into the church to build our cathedrals. So they see us as part of a problem. And the truth is, it looks like that's the truth. Unfortunately, and some of us are trying to say, let's internally regulate and, and reform. Yeah. You know, All or right. else external regulations and reforms will come upon us. I've been saying that for like 20 years. Okay. People have been telling me to keep quiet. Now he's here. If we don't internally reform, external reforms will come. All right. I, I, I want to quickly bring in, we've just been joined by um, Adito Kumbo Mumuni. He's the executive director of uh, a socioeconomic rights and accountability project, SERAP. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, sir. Hello? Uh, can you hear me clearly, sir? Yes. 
Brilliant. So, I, um, well, you, you joined us um, almost at the tail end of the program, but I want to quickly get your thoughts on this. Um, some people feel like the government is trying to silence the heads of the church against criticizing government. Uh, would you agree in any way, you know, to, with this? And the truth of the matter is that uh, we have to look at when a legislation is in made to be put at existing one. Or an existing one is being discarded to be a new legislation. We have to look at the background to what the government wants to do. There are three methods by which legislations are interpreted. There is the literal rule of interpretation, there is a good rule of interpretation, and there is the mischief rule of interpretation. Let us look at what the state of the law was before the introduction of this new Now, the, the, the religious body that we know in Nigeria are not normally critical of government. It has never been the top of that government. Those who that government in the game are in the NGO, non-governmental organization. So I don't see how and why we have to guard the choices. So I don't, I don't, I don't believe. I apologize for the. Um... Yeah, I think we may have to, um, of course, go back to uh, Yomi Kasali. Apologies for the poor quality in the audio. Um, they're speaking with the executive director of uh, Serap. I'm going to quickly um, end the conversation this evening with uh, Yomi Kasali. Let's quickly bring you back. Um, you know, I was asking, you know, um, a few minutes ago um, about if this is in any way going to silence the voices of uh, criticism from church leaders. Um, I know that a lot of Nigerians want um, the church to be a very vocal body with regards um, injustice and with regards, you know, all that might be going on in society. Um, so do you feel that, you know, these things may also uh, silence those voices that have spoken um, for the people? I don't think so. This cannot silence the voices of the people. It cannot silence the, um, the preachers from preaching righteousness. And look, we are speaking against the killings in Southern Cardinal for the past two, three, four months. Some of us are bleeding, we're weeping, we're not happy because um, predominantly the, that place is um, Christians. We have more Christians than are Muslims. And so if our brothers have been slaughtered, you know, we feel bad about that. So nobody can use karma to stop us from speaking. I don't think so. We have we have forty nine percent of Nigerians are Christians, or some say fifty one. So between forty nine percent and fifty one, I don't think that can come. I can never stop preachers from preaching. Listen, I don't know how many Catholics, how many trustees the Catholic Church got or Baptist. We have God knows how many preachers, thousands and tens of thousands of preachers in the country. So how many trustees do we have in those churches? If if I think somebody wants to silence me, all I'll just do is um. Definitely. I mean, you know, no, no, put okay. the right people um, in my trustees and they will run the church for us Kassali, um, let, let financially. Quick, let me quickly I interject the, there. The spiritual part of the church. Let me quickly interject there. I'm, I'm not saying silence church leaders from preaching. I'm saying silence okay. them from criticizing government. They can't. They can't stop us. You see, those that would continue to criticize government will do so. And I don't think that can stop anybody. That's what I'm saying. I just talked to you about what's happening with uh, Southern Cardinal. That will be seen as criticism. Sometimes not constructive, but we will criticize when we see injustice, when we see the failings of government in some areas, delivering infrastructure, campaign promises. Preachers and uh, will continue to speak. And we are moral leaders. We will continue to you know, speak truth to power. 
at a state level, local government level, national assembly level, and of course, we spoke against the National Assembly's budget. So many things are happening. We're speaking and we will continue to speak against these issues. I don't think this can ever stop preachers from criticizing the government when they err. I just don't believe that sometimes we do it fairly. All right. Um, we're, we're almost out of time with this conversation. I'm, I'm going to quickly also bring in Adit yes. Tokumba Mumuni once again. Um, I hope that it's going to be um, easier to have this com uh, conversation now. So, uh, go ahead, please. I, I want to hear what you think must be done to have better understanding of what this law says and, um, of course, bring us all together. Can the of church leaders, government, and the Nigerian people? Hello? I'm saying just before we go, I, I want your thoughts on what must be done um, to have better understanding of what the government is trying to achieve with this new uh, with this law, and also bring us all together um, as one body. And I'm talking now about the Christian Association of Nigeria, uh, church leaders, Nigerians, and the government. What must be done so that we can understand this better and move on? You see, let us look at what should be the responsibility of a government? The government of the land is under the constitution entitled to make law for the peace, order, and good governance of the entire space known as the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Now, what does this law intend to achieve? If the purpose of the law is to reign in the churches or reign in the critical element in the society, then that is not the purpose of government. The culture of Nigeria says that the primary purpose of government shall be the welfare and benefit of the Nigerian people. So how does this type of law that is now being made help that cause? I submit with respect that that law, especially the one that affects churches, NGOs, does not support the goal of the Nigerian constitution are conceived by the makers of the Nigerian constitution. There are a lot of things that the government can do to see that um, the interest, benefits, welfare of the Nigerian people is taken care of. How many laws at this present democratic dispensation passed for the benefit of the Nigerian people. Those are the areas that this government should look into. There's so much poverty in the land. The government should use legislation to take care of the Nigerian poverty, not an attempt by legislation to harass critical voices in the Nigerian nation. All right. That, to me, is not the purpose of government. Okay. All right. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Reverend Yomi Kasali, Senior Pastor, Foundation of Truth Assembly, and also Adeto Gombo Mumuni, the Executive Director of the Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project. I wish we had more time um, because there are so many details of this conversation that, you know, we would still need to, you know, open. Um, but thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, the Edo state government is asked uh, to prevent um, incitive statements and, of course, uh, the rule of law being broken um, with regards an election that is coming up very soon. We'll be back. The Situation Room has expressed worry over the escalation of violence between the two major political parties in Edo State, the People's Democratic Party, PDP, and the All Progressives Congress, APC, ahead of the upcoming governorship election. The convener of the Situation Room, Ernest Uwankwo, while speaking to newsmen in Abuja, said public statements by the two major contenders have continued to heighten tensions in the state. 
Situation Room is concerned about the rhetorics and isolated incidents of violence in Edo State ahead of the September 19, 2020 governorship election. Public statements by candidates and the political parties, especially the two main parties, is heightening political tension in the state and stoking violence. Issue-based campaigns have been relegated to the background and citizens have not been offered any real electoral choices. Recent actions by political actors indicate threats to the peaceful conduct of the elections, including squabbles over membership and leadership of the State House Assembly in that state. In addition to violence-leading campaigns, Situation Room is worried that these campaigns have been conducted in total disregard of COVID-19 pandemic protection protocols of campaign and voting. Escalation of COVID-19 cases represent a threat to voter turnout and participation in the election. The situation welcomes INEX trial of a portal whereby voters and the public at large can see their polling unit level results online within hours of voting closing. We have seen the poll at the week uh, in recent uh, days at the National State Assembly polls where this was tried out. We are calling on the security agencies like we did you know, mention here. These persons are not above the law. When people make such statements that rock foul of the Electoral Act, they should, the state agencies of state should be provoked to make arrests. Let them make statements because they are criminalized conduct. And, you know, constantly we are seeing that they are counting on non-state actors, purveyors of violence, by political violence and entrepreneurs. Why is, why is the Nigerian police not acting now? That is the big question. They should desist from giving the impression of institutional bias. People should be under arrest and investigation.